Shalom. Today we are starting a new presentation concerning the wine and the bread. The initiation of many of the appointed times, and particularly Sabbath, begins with a ceremony which is called Kiddush, or in Yiddish, it's pronounced Kiddush. Typically on a Friday night, the family will gather around before the meal. The candles will be lit first, uh, usually by the woman, by the mother of the house. And then there is a special blessings, which are set on the, on the wine. Strictly speaking, the Kiddush just involves the wine, but it's usually followed by the bread. And you can see on the table there, there's a little thing covered by a cloth, a little bump, and that would be the bread. I'm sure you've probably participated in this ceremony, maybe once or twice or more times. Maybe you do it every Friday night or even on uh, Saturday. Perhaps you have noticed that the blessings for the wine and the bread are quite different. In, for the wine, we say bore pri hagafen, and the verb there is create, to create the fruit of the vine. For the bread, we say, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz, who brings forth bread from the earth. So we're going to investigate the meanings of these two different ideas. For many other foods, the word bore is used. Uh, in the first example here, bore mine mizonot, who creates all kinds of foods. Uh, specifically, I think it refers to the grains, different grains, which are not um, for bread, not wheat. Uh, we have bore prihaetz, which um, is the blessing used for fruit. Perhaps very recently at your Passover, when you took the parsley, you took the karpas before you dipped it in the salt water, and you said a blessing, bore prihaadama, who creates the fruit of the earth. This word, uh, bara, this root, is Strong's. Uh, 1254, and the, its first use is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We will find, as we look through all the uses of bara, that they are most exclusively used for when God creates something. When we see in Psalm 51, verse 10, Lev tahor bara li, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. In other places, we have talked about how the heart is the residential place of the spirit of the man. We see them sitting here in parallel. The word tahor, which means clean, means ritually clean. And so for God to come live in us, in our heart, we must have a ritually clean place for him to dwell. David is saying, create in me. So only God can create that holy place, that place, that clean place, ritually clean place. There's nothing we can do to clean up our heart. As we read, the heart is uh, deceitful, evil, above all things. And we need God to come and fix that problem so that his spirit can come and live within us. We see in Ecclesiastes 12.7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So God gives the Spirit. It's an exclusive act that God does. We must receive it, but he gives it. He prepares the place, the heart. He makes it ritually clean, and he gives the right spirit. So this is the blessing uh, parallel to the blessing for the wine that God creates the fruit of the vine, the wine represents the spirit. The bread, however, has a different blessing and a different vocabulary. Both these blessings, by the way, are documented as far back as the Talmud, that these are the blessings to use for bread and wine. The rabbis say that the reason the bread blessing specifically is different is from the scripture in Psalm 104:14. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle, an herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Lahotzi lechem min ha'aretz. 
when we look for the first use of this verb hotsi, we find in Genesis 1, 12, uh, and 13. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. We do not see here that God is bore, creating the grass. He doesn't yet sar, form or shape the grass. Um, he doesn't bana the grass. He doesn't build it as he does uh, for the woman. The potential for the grass is already in the earth. It's very significant that it, grass actually appears on the third day. You think about all the things that happen on the third day. This is the first time this concept appears. The potential for something is there, but there is nothing. We don't see anything until the third day. In Matthew 12, 40, Yeshua gave uh, the sign to the generation. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And on the third day we know he arose. Very interesting, the, the blessing for the bread is almost a prophecy. In John six thirty five, Yeshua said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Yeshua is the bread, and after three days and three nights, he came forth from the earth. We are also asked to bring forth fruit. Uh, John 15, 4 to 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. There is an, an inference here that we have to bring forth the fruit. It's Yes, it's by the Spirit, but the fruit will, be, will correspond to our works, the things that we do in our body. And we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such things there are no laws. So we have this correlation um, about the idea of what comes from the Spirit and how the body reflects those things and produces those acts. Reflected in James 2, 20-25. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers, and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James sets up this correla correlation between the spirit and faith, and the body and the works. The wine is representing the spirit and the faith, presenting the, the bread is representing the body and the works. Let's look a little bit further into these uh, correspondences. Interestingly, vines, uh, grape vines, will produce for over 40 years. So just like a spiritual aspect of life will continue on through your whole life, the vines will produce for a long time. However, wheat or bread must be planted every year. In other words, we must always be vigilant for the opportunity of doing good works. Grapes are harvested in the fall, uh, much as the souls, 
the spirits of men. We have seen the spirits of people will go back to God at the end, at the end of the season. But wheat is harvested in the spring, and so we begin to do our good works as soon as we uh, have learned to walk with Yeshua. The wine has a natural yeast to it. Nothing must be added. The Spirit of God, as it comes, is complete and fill us, and it's uh, applicable for every good work and everything that we need to do. But the bread requires a human intervention of adding the yeast. The fermentation for wine is slow. It will take several days, up to several weeks. In other words, it's a, a long-lasting process, just as spiritual growth is a longer-lasting process. The fermentation for bread is very quick. It will happen in maybe two or three hours. Just as we must be constantly looking for the opportunity to do works. Works will be constant through our day, how we can apply those things which were listed in Galatians. Wine, as soon as it is ready, made, and finished, is processed immediately. It's immediately stored. In other words, the grapes are immediately processed, and they go through the whole process, and the wine is stored as a final product. So we can see the spirit there. Uh, one, once it has its beginning activity, it's there and available for us to use any time. Wheat, on the other hand, is stored as a raw material, and it is processed as we need it. So we, uh, we might be called on for different times to do different things. We must be aware of our surroundings, of our spiritual surroundings, what, how we proceed in every situation, and then we will produce those things as needed. Wine itself is not cooked. It is, uh, comes to a finished product by itself. Bread does need to be cooked. Again, it's a human intervention. Wine is for special seasons. It's certainly not necessary for every day. And just like there are certain sweet seasons when we feel closer to the spirit, or not, I'm not saying that we don't look for the spirit every day, but there are there is an ebb and flow to the communication and life with the spirit but the bread the works that we do are for daily life we need to be practicing those things all the time wine has a quicker effect on your body than bread but it also wears off more quickly again the ebb and flow of life in the spirit uh, bread has a long a longer effect on your physical body but it sustains you it keeps you going. As we have seen, the wine represents the blood and the bread represents the body. We'll see Yeshua's uh, scripture in a minute. Wine is like the faith. It comes from the spirit. And the um, bread is parallel to our works that we do. And they are like the truth. Whenever we see wine and bread together, we are looking at a situation of covenant making. Genesis 14, 18. This is the first example. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. And you see that he and Abraham come into an understanding of what their relationship is. Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Abraham ties to Melchizedek in a foreshadowing of the Levitical ties. Genesis, Genesis 40, verse 5, Joseph is stuck in prison. Interestingly, he is in prison with a butler, representing the cup, the wine, and the baker, um, who represents, obviously, the, the bread. And so he is, Joseph is in, in prison with both of them. I find it interesting that it is the baker, the maker of the bread, the, the body, which uh, our bodies are temporary in this world. He is the one who is going to die. He is not going to uh, go forward in life. But the, the butler, who represents the wine and the cup and the spirit, he is the one whose life is preserved. So that's kind of interesting. There is a covenant meal which takes place in Ruth 2.14. 
And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. Many commentators have noted that this is a covenant meal. Yes, it's not uh, wine, but it is, uh, it's translated as vinegar. The word chametz comes from the word which is to rise, to rise bread, to be fermented or to be leavened. Vinegar is uh, fermented beyond wine, but you can see in the word vinegar, it comes from the word for wine. We read the book of Ruth at the holiday of Shavuot of Pentecost. It is a, uh, a harvest theme. We see when Ruth and Naomi are coming back, it's the beginning of the barley harvest, and it's running through the wheat harvest. Now, one of the reasons that it takes so long for this process to occur is that it was required in ancient Jewish law that a widow could not marry another man for three months so they could be sure of the paternity of the child. So the, the story of the book drags on through, through that time, so we see that that time was completed. We know that the festival of Shavuot is the time of the acceptance of the Gentiles, of the non-Hebrew people, into the covenant. That is what the, the festival signifies. And the, the story of Ruth is perfect. It's the story of the Gentile bride coming into the line, into the very line of Messiah. Here's another opportunity for you to be in covenant. Proverbs 9, 4, 5. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she, that is wisdom, the paragraph is talking about wisdom, saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. An opportunity to be in covenant with wisdom. Again, the words of Yeshua at the Passover meal as they were eating. Yeshua took bread. And blessed. I know it says it, but there is no it in the, in the actual Greek. Yeshua blessed the Lord. The, the blessings that you see are Baruch Ata Yahweh. Blessed are you, Yahweh. They're not blessed is the bread. Um, so that's a King James uh, kind of problem there. He blessed and he broke, that is the bre bread. And gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is said for, shed for many for the remission of sins. Uh, many of the translations here say covenant. Uh, it is one word in Greek. It's the same word miscellaneously translated testament and covenant i almost think that uh, the um the translators use testament here so nobody would go say oh well where is the new covenant and go off and look and find oh my goodness it's in jeremiah the what we call the new testament the new covenant that covenant the parameters of that covenant are in jeremiah and the context of this service is the Passover meal. This is so important. The Passover meal is for the remembrance of the exodus of e from Egypt. The wonders that, that Yahweh God did in taking his people out of bondage. It is the beginning of their home coming, going back to, to their land, which God promised them. As Yeshua is talking about the New Covenant, and he's talking about the New Covenant in Jeremiah, he references that Old Covenant. He said, look, I made a covenant with the people of Israel when I brought them out of Egypt. And where did they go? They went to Sinai and they received Torah. But he said, they broke that covenant, even though I was their husband. You know, he says, I was their husband, but they broke covenant with me. So now I'm going to make a new covenant. And the parameters of that covenant are in Jeremiah 31. Yeshua says, this is the time. This is a parallel experience coming out of Egypt, 
going home to the promised land is a parallel experience to what I, Yeshua, am now doing among you, and I am instituting this new covenant whereby Torah will be written on your hearts. Very important to understand the context of what happened. So next time we'll talk a little bit about the difference between Kiddush and communion as it's uh, practiced in most churches. And in the meantime, tasimata inayim al keep your eyes on the sky. Shalom.